Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sinan, and I'm a postdoc uh, in IPAC at, at Caltech. And uh, this next session is going to be a one hour long one uh, with 45 to 50 minutes for the talk, and then 15 minutes to uh, 10 minutes for, for the questions, basically. Uh, so the next speaker is going to be uh, Paul Marin, uh, director of the Polar Geospatial Center at the University of Minnesota. And uh, he's going to be talking about an ongoing transformation in the geosciences. So it's been, it's been fascinating uh, listening to all of your talks. Um, what, what I'm going to be talking about is about as different as you could get in, in kind of still being in science. Um, my job is to provide geospatial support for polar investigators. So we make maps. Um, we make maps maps because you know polar in you know office polar programs is defined by geography, and it's off in a way it's defined by geography because it's hard to get there, and logistics are really difficult. You know, one of the other aspects of of the community is we have people that go back and forth between the poles. We're we've gone from a time when we were largely field oriented to more and more being cyber infrastructure and HPC and, and imagery remote sensing based. And so we're running into something that I think you guys know very well, that we're starting to see more and more and more um, data from all the different instruments up there. And you know, just to kind of put this in context here, um, here's Antarctica, you know, it's the, 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 everyone always talks about it's, it's the, the highest, the driest, the coldest, that kind of thing. And it's about 15 million square kilometers. And to put that into perspective, here's the lower 48. So the lower 48 is about two thirds of Antarctica. You know, when you're, when you're looking at this, um, you know, keep in mind that yeah, in total, I have about one or two dozen people to deal with an entire continent. And then if you start thinking about the other pole, you know, here's that. And we're talking about 20 million square kilometers here. So it really is, as far as land area goes, about twice the area of, of, uh, of the lower 48. And so we have a vast area to deal with. And... You know, to, to get an idea of where we come from, this is where we come from. I mean, we really do go in the field and, you know, here's a Scott tent and we sleep in Scott tents and we go to the middle of nowhere. And we have some pretty amazing modes of transportation. We have, we have good rides. So, you know, here's a piston bully pulling a camp, you know, on the, on the, uh, on the ice sheet, uh, and then we've got uh, a couple of icebreakers in the Antarctic. There, there are shared ones up in the Arctic. We have, you know, LC-130 transports, you know, from, from the Air Force and the New York Air National Guard with JATO bottles, basically rockets out the back and skis. You know, we're seriously out there collecting data. So here's one of the, one of the um, um, atmospheric facilities, you know, uh, on the, on the, Something, a place called Summit on the Greenland Ice Sheet. Here's McMurdo. It's basically, it's one of the big logistics hubs. You can tell from all the, the uh, resource dumps all over the place here and the fuel tanks. You know, it's, it's up to a thousand people during, during a normal season. And if we, if we zoom in here, you know, to, to this area here, that's our other office. So we've got one office in St. Paul that is... Um, uh, you know, on the, you know, on the campus of the University of Minnesota, and then another office in McMurdo. And this, this little wooden building back here, that's the NSF office in, in Antarctica. It's called the Chalet. And to put this in context, you know, let's go back a little bit. 1817, we didn't even know Antarctica was there. So, you know, we have the best maps we have at this point. It's Baldwin, uh, Craddock, and Joy. And, you know, Greenland, they thought Greenland and, and Canada were connected. They knew Svalbard was there and they knew it was an island, but no one had been able to get to Antarctica 
And then by 1838, you have James Wild, and it's still really not there. They're starting to see some of the sub-Antarctic islands. So these are hard-won maps. These are hard-won data sets because people are going there bit by bit. And of course, the next one about 1861 is from Colton. And now you have um, ships, and, and in this case, it's the Erebus, uh, going down there, and they're actually starting to trace out just the coastline and just what they can see from the ocean. And you can actually, uh, on, on this map on the left, those lines there are, you know, is the route of the different expeditions down to Antarctica. Then, once you start getting into 19 teens, you start seeing the British Antarctic Expedition. So this is Scott's expedition to the pole. Um, and yeah, there's more and more and more on the interior, but these are hard won data points. They're, they're walking across the ice sheet. And in fact, as most of you know, they didn't, they didn't make it back. And it's not really until 97 where we had the radar set Antarctic mapping project. So it wasn't until 97 that we really had a sense of the shape and the texture at high resolution of the continent itself. And it wasn't until 2008 that we had a Landsat image mosaic of Antarctica by, by Bob Binchadler and a number of other people, including NASA and NSF investigators and the British Antarctic Survey. And you'll notice that there's a hole at the pole. And there's a hole there because um, we, the, 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 the satellite doesn't go perfectly pole to pole. It's, it's got an inclination. It goes down to 82 south. And so this is where things stood. We had a little inkling of, of time dependence. We had you know, 15 and 30 meter pixels. We had a little bit of data. And then in recent years, about the last 10 years, um, actually the last 20 years, uh, ever since um, the, um, uh, there was a presidential directive to set up the commercial um, imagery industry. And so this is where a number of things happen. This is where high quality, high resolution, optical imagery satellites were launched. This is where the Europeans and the Canadians started to launch radar satellites. And the US was buying that imagery. And it was also with the ever plummeting cost of, of uh, launch, we started to see more and more innovation. And this kind of thing started to happen. So this is the Indian Space Agency. There, it's, it's an early launch in their program. Uh, a company called Planet was launching a number of small sats on this, on, this, uh, on this vehicle. And what happened was it gets to low Earth orbit, it dumps out, and then it starts dumping out the satellites. And so these satellites are just incredible you know, pieces of innovation. And so in this one launch, as they're throwing them out the back, they launched 104 optical satellites into orbit. And let's start putting this into perspective. And on the right is, is something called um, Worldview 3. It's a satellite that's owned by a company called Maxar. Uh, they have licensed imagery to the US government. The, the imagery is just exquisite. It's, it's uh, about 30 centimeter panchromatic and about four times that resolution uh, coarser for, um, for multispectral imagery. And then on the left is a picture of the planet Dove. That's what you just saw launched. And on the, on the figure below, you see the differences in scale of these things and the differences in philosophy. So if you look up at the, 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 um, the table up above, you know, it's, it's one foot versus three to five meter. You know, it's four satellites. Each one of these satellites are, um, you know, about three quarters of a billion dollars for the Maxars. There are only four up right now, but Planet is keeping somewhere above 150 in orbit. And, and then there are other aspects of, of all these satellites that really, really become interesting. But one of the most interesting aspects of this is we can get 
on with the with the planet imagery on the left, we can get a constant deluge of optical imagery. So their goal is to index the surface of the earth in much the same way that Google has indexed the internet. And so it may not be the most perfect imagery in the world, but you're getting three to five meter resolution imagery for nearly the entire surface of the planet about, uh, about once a day. And remember, it's optical. And so, you know, you, you always have the problem of, can you see the ground, you know, because of clouds and just atmospheric problems. And, you know, along, once you get the imagery, you have um, access, you know, you can get access to a viewer. And this really is something very similar to Google Maps, except it's nearly live. And so you're talking about five meter imagery everywhere. And this is a place in, in Greenland called uh, Ilulisat, and, the, and there's a, uh, a glacier kind of, you can see it uh, broken up on the, um, in the fjord in the middle uh, called uh, Jakobshaven. And this is probably the glacier that calved off the iceberg that sank, sank the Titanic. So it's one of the most productive and rapid glaciers on earth. And if you look both on the left and below, you can see that there's imagery almost every day. We can get it and get it and get it and get it. And it comes as both a mosaic and it comes as individual scenes. And so we've gone from a time where I was showing you, we were fighting for individual data points about the location just of a mountain. And, you know, recorded by, by Scott as he's, he's sledging to the pole to a time when we have imagery of nearly the whole planet plus the poles, you have the whole planet at, at about daily. And then you have the poles probably four times a day because several of these satellites aren't polar orbiting. And so as you get access to these different constellations of satellites, you know, because we are really a science support organization, we're a service organization, we start going through the list of people funded at the polls and we start picking out people and introducing them to the imagery. And we've been doing this for 10, 12 years now. And of course, in Antarctica, everyone would be disappointed and I would be remiss if I didn't start with penguins. And so one of the interesting aspects of, of penguins, and in this case, what you have are, are emperors, is that they, they come out of the ocean, they come out from feeding during the austral summer, they mate, lay eggs, and then the males stay with the eggs starting at the beginning of winter. And so it's just like March of the Penguins, they're sitting there the whole winter just to keep the eggs warm. And so this causes an issue if you're a biologist that wants to figure out what the population is because you have to come really at one of the, you know, the, the beginning of the end of the season. So you have to come out and find these colonies and count them. And sometimes they're near McMurdo. Sometimes they're near a station. Sometimes they're really in the middle of nowhere. And what, what ha what's happened is for years and years and years, penguin scientists and, and, and biologists of all kinds would go out with the icebreakers. And when there was an opportunity, they would jump out and start counting. And this becomes a problem. Now, these aren't penguins, or I mean, these aren't emperors, but it gives you a sense of there's a problem when you're trying to hand count these things. Not only do you not know where the colony is, it's that you run into these colonies sometimes and they're just astronomically huge. And so, some of some of the the people we support, and in this case, it's Michelle Larue, who's now in uh, Christchurch, New Zealand, and Heather Lynch, who's at uh, Stony Brook, um, have have been counting penguins using remote sensing, and you know you start look, start seeing things like this, and these the, these are images that you can just find in Google Maps or sorry Google Earth, and you know up above you can see the beginning of a season. In this this case, these are probably Adelis. This is off the Antarctic Peninsula, and you can see all that kind of that kind of fur uh, on the on the on the uh, snow and ice up above, and those are individual penguins. And 
as the season goes on, this is you know several months later in December, you can see that there's this big kind of reddish brown spot and that's basically guano. So they're starting to use these, these um, um, the, this imagery to, to not only identify the new colonies, but identify individual penguins. And so, you know, all of this is taken directly from Google Earth. At the same time, these scientists are going in there and they're going in there in, in fairly creative ways. So this is going into the South Sandwich Islands. There's a, a, a location map down on the lower right. This is, I think, officially the middle of nowhere on planet Earth. It's, um, you know, it's, you know, even, even the U.S. Antarctic program, I don't know, can't think of the last time we went there. But they, you know, these scientists chartered a, a motor sailboat, and then they went in with uh, survivor suits on and a Zodiac and climbed onto these islands. They don't have any kind of, of harbor and no place to really get on. So you're doing your best right here. And so with this combination of remote sensing and, and field work, they were able to put more and more and more pictures together and a picture of, of the populations. And so, you know, they discovered when they first started to use the imagery that they were finding these super colonies. They had about 14 of them. And the super colonies were 70% of the total regional penguin uncertainty. And so if they could just get imagery of those locations, they could, they could do an ac accurate count. And so the traditional methods of going in there with an icebreaker or a helicopter just, just aren't possible. And so with the imagery, you could start finding these colonies and you can, you can actually see in the, in, the, in the image above that you get these kind of blob locations because different penguins have different diets and some are eating krill and so their guano is more red and then the other penguins are, are eating fish and their guano is more brown or white. And so they can actually start telling the species apart and they're doing this by hand. But, you know, back to the emperors, you know, remember the penguins are just on the edge. They're sea ice obligates. In other words, they, they have to mate on sea ice. So they jump up on the sea ice and that's where it happened. It happens. It doesn't happen on, on rock or the land ice. And, you know, in the beginning, when we started to use both, both the high resolution commercial imagery and Landsat, they immediately found 10 more colonies with Landsat and they found six more colonies with, with commercial imagery. So they went from really knowing nothing about the, the penguins, you know, the penguin colonies, to, to really being able to nail down a population. And so this is what some of those, those emperor colonies look like. This is uh, at the Bay Emperor Colony. It's near uh, Neumeyer Station, a German station. You know, you can actually see the, uh, that, that dark stain on the upper, upper left towards the center on top um, is, is the guano stain and the, the, the penguin huddle is on the lower right. This now starts lending itself to machine techniques for, 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 for AI. And so, you know, they, we have all kinds of techniques and the earlier technique we, we, we had, you know, basically said we now have 595,000 penguins plus or minus about 14%. So this is this really unusual situation now that we knew that we had something different because um, with the imagery and with the life cycle of the emperors, they obligingly came out of the ocean and then stood on, as black objects, stood on white ice, allowing us to image them. And so they're really the first vertebrate species that we could do a census of from space. So, and now think of what we can do then. If we can do this one year, we can do it multiple years. If we can do it once in a season, we possibly can do it multiple times in a season. So this is now leading to different population models and different models for trying to figure out what the dynamics of, you know, a of, of starting a new colony or a colony collapse. Because 
you know, penguins, really what they're doing for us is they go swimming, they eat, they come back, they deposit their guano. And that gives us a sense of what is in the ocean and the health is in the ocean. If we see it go from, from, um, from krill to fish and change color, we know that something's happening in the ocean. And so let's get back to the imagery. We've got access as, you know, off the polar programs to a large amount of U.S. government licensed imagery. And a few years ago during the Obama administration, there was a, a, a push. Once we, we had the, the chairmanship of the Arctic Council to really lead, what could we do? And so myself, along with a couple of colleagues at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, figured that we would push and try to use this imagery to, to um, assemble the topography of the entire Arctic. And it's one of those projects that you get once in your career. And we got an enormous amount of traction, including this. So I can't really hear the audio, but uh, you can't. You'll need to okay. share your sound. Okay, so yeah, I don't know how to. I was hoping that could get to you. So basically, he's announcing that the NSF and the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency are going to work together to produce elevation of Alaska in a year and the entire Arctic in two years. And there are a couple of things I learned from this announcement. Number one, your kids don't really care if, if the president announces your, your project, but your staff does. And it really focused attention um, and was able to help us marshal resources to move things forward quickly. And so Ohio State and Bird Polar, uh, Ian Howitt and MJ No, um, wrote, software that's basically photogrammetry. I mean, this is nothing new to you guys in astronomy that it, you know, when, when we use the, the, the satellites to take an image, orbit another 45 seconds and take another image, it allows us to, to do photogrammetry really, really, really accurately. And their innovation was to strip off all of the, um, the metadata that comes along with the imagery and it allowed us to automate the process of, of elevation extraction. The second thing that really made a difference was we got access to Blue Waters and the staff of Blue Waters, and we were able to stand up our code in a matter of, uh, of weeks. And then they worked with us over quite a long period of time. And they're still working with us to this day. To, to optimize the code and the submission of jobs and all kinds of things just to, just to help us make this, this data as quickly as possible. And in a year, Alaska came up. You know, so you know, originally it was two meter. We're, we're, we've now created a, a, a two meter Alaska. Um, it's just one of the most astounding things in your life that you've ever seen in your life. And, you know, a, a year later, we did the Arctic, and we continue to do the Arctic. And we knew we had something when we started to create this data. And, you know, we would send it off to our friends and our colleagues all over the world, and they would start to do comparisons. And so we sent it to our friends in Iceland, and this was their elevation model before uh, Arctic Den. And this is Reykjavik. And it was, it was done right around uh, the time of World War II, and they just hadn't had um, the resources to be able to do it at higher resolution. And so this is before, and this is after. So you know, the elevation is good enough here that you can navigate through the streets. So we were just pleased about how it was going. Here's a place called Kotzebue, Alaska. Now, the USGS has had a really incredible effort to produce uh, elevation in Alaska using using airborne radar. But this was this was the data before that, and so this is Kotzebue. That this is where uh, President Obama announced this project, 
and it was before us and before the the IFSAR elevation. Whoops. Oh, and I don't have the after. Sorry about that. And so if we're going to do the Arctic, we might as well do the Antarctic anyway. So the Arctic's about 12% of the planet. The Antarctic's about 8% of the planet. And so Ian Howitt and, and a number of other people, MJ No and a few others, um, with our help, produced the reference elevation model of Antarctica, which is the, the, the counterpart to, to, to Arctic Dam. And this really became something that, that you know, we just... You know, it's like if you remember that time when you saw Google Earth for the first time and you just wasted the whole night and you went to bed late, that's what it's like. That's what it's been like having this data. And if we go in and, and, and look at different areas like the Ross Ice Shelf down here, so McMurdo's down here, Hull, of course, is here. Look at this area next. It's just one of the most incredible things you've seen in your life. So if you, if you think about ice, ice is just a highly viscous liquid. You know, it's solid, but it wants to flow downhill. And you can see the ice flowing from all directions into the Ross Ice Shelf. And, you know, with this data, it's just incredible. And if we go over to the left here, um, or we call it, you know, West Antarctica, because, you know, when you look at, you know, the, the prime meridian in Antarctica, um, uh, up on top of the continent, we talk about West Antarctica is the, the left and East Antarctica is, is the right. Let's go to the next one. You can, you can see this, this, this ice tumbling down the hill from left to right. And then and the right and the lower right is the uh, Ross Ice Shelf. And then if we zoom in even more to this area way on the bottom, there, there are a whole bunch of... Uh, uh, little tiny mountaintops that kind of poke through the, the Ross ice shelf. This is what it looks like. So you're seeing ice flow over uh, these mountaintops just the same way that you'd see water uh, flowing around, um, uh, flowing around uh, rocks in a stream. And so keep in mind, we, we've got a certain advantage in, in the earth sciences and in mapping and in remote sensing that there are all kinds of agencies interested in this. You know, you've got U.S. Geological Survey, you know, all kinds of Department of, of Interior, DOD, Intelligence Community, NASA, everybody wants this data. And so we were fortunate enough that when Blue Waters was ending, with the, when NSF was ending their support of Blue Waters, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency picked up the bill. And so now we have, um, you know, Blue Waters lives on. It's working on this project for the whole world. And, you know, that, that pie chart on the bottom is one of those things that you never think that you're going to see in your life. Basically about 90% of Blue Waters just working on topography, mapping the earth. So remember, we're collecting this data and we're collecting it over and over and over. And the natural thing, if you make maps for a living, is you wanna make that map. I mean, you know, those earlier pictures of the Arctic and the Antarctic that I showed you, is just, I find them highly ironic because, you know, we're using all of this high performance computing time, but we're producing a piece of paper. And so if you think about it, if we've been lucky enough to collect the entire Arctic or the entire Antarctic, everything's geolocated. We can go in and we can start um, uh, subtracting things. And so here's an area. This is um, the Vavilov ice cap. So if you go to the middle of Siberia and you go up right before you get to Canada, this is an ice cap up there. And so it was, this was done by Mike Willis at CU Boulder. And this was really one of the first times we started to subtract things. And if you watch this area here, I'll, I'll step you through a couple of years. So 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016. So this is the collapse of an ice cap. This is sea level rise in action. So something's, this ice is going from on land to floating. And so this is making sea level go up. 
we never thought we would see, see this and never thought we would see it so clearly. And so remember what I've shown you so far. I'm showing you examples of very discrete places that we have a high level, where we have a high level of understanding. And I'm gonna show you that once more. So this is a case called Berry Arm. So it's the middle of Alaska. If you look here, it's, it's right about here. And so if you go to the middle of Alaska and then down, it's not along the Aleutians and not along Southeast Alaska. It's an area where there's been a lot of retreat of the glaciers. And so Chinle Dai at Ohio State and, and um, uh, on, a, on a Lilladal, had, had a reason to go in there and take the time-dependent strips of Arctic down. They would put them together, align them, and subtract them. And they started in the fjords to find some really interesting structures. And so they found differences here that they really couldn't explain. And so um, these areas, um, you know, on, on top of the on top of the uh, the fjord, started to lose area, and below they started to gain. And after talking to some locals, they discovered that what they were seeing was a landslide that hasn't quite happened yet. And so, what you have in these fjords are these incredible steep slopes that were all cut by glaciers over thousands and thousands of years. And as the glacier has retreated, the buttressing has, has been removed. And as the buttressing has been removed, there's, there's pressure, just gravity, on these glacier, on these, sorry, these, these fjord walls to start to slough downward. But at the same time, these walls are held together by permafrost and the area is melting. And so the structural um, integrity of these fjord walls is starting to fail. If we get to another picture here, it's this area. And to just put that in perspective, it's this, the amount that's moving is half a cubic kilometer. This is how much material is starting to be removed. And so this becomes not only scientifically interesting, but it becomes, um, it becomes a safety issue because this area is so large and it's right next to this fjord that if this fell, it would create a 200 meter tall tsunami that would be focused down the fjord and towards Woody or Alaska that could see about a 20 meter tall tsunami. And so immediately this was picked up by the USGS, uh, NOAA, and the Alaska Department of um, uh, um, Natural Resources. And they started to, to uh, instrument the site so that they could see uh, what's happening over time. And so this was covered in the New York Times and the Guardian. You know, now they're looking at you know, the new climate threat in Alaska are tsunamis from melting permafrost. We never thought this was possible before. But these are all very, very discrete locations. You're saying, we don't need AI for this. Well, you do if all of a sudden you had to analyze the entire arc. And so remember, we've, we've got tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of these elevation strips. We need to be able to put them together and difference, in, difference them, and then take that differencing, we need to train some AI models on it and to figure out what's there. So if you start to look at this map below, not only are you seeing areas that perhaps might fall, like these areas near Seward and Whittier and Yakutep and all these other places, but you're starting to get more areas that can that then those that can be analyzed by, by hand. And so another example here is vegetation change. Since we've got topography, we're really just looking, you know, because we're using optical imagery, the tops of trees. And so we've got an image from 2012 and an image from 2015. 
You do the elevation, you align the two, you put them together, you difference them. Here is that difference. So you can start to see individual clear cuts here. You can see an access road. So the imagery and the elevation is good enough. You can see the individual access roads. And then you can start to see in the clear cut that when, when the trees were removed, they were 20 meters tall on one side of the clear cut and 12 meters on the other side. And so this started to tell us that we had something, but we needed to do this on the biggest scale possible. And Jim Tucker and Martin Brandt started to look at this. Jim's at NASA and Martin's in, in Copenhagen. And they started to look at semi-arid lands. And in this case, it's the Sawhill. It's this area just, just below the Sahara where you've got this semi-arid land that looks like this. So it's very, very dry, but you've got this green tree on top. And so this gives you an image where you can see the green canopy against a very, very red or just a dark non-green background. And so what they did was they collected an enormous amount of high quality sub-meter optical imagery that was licensed to the government. They assembled it all and they went from the Atlantic all the way to the Red Sea. So this is just a huge amount of area. This is 8% of the planet Earth. And it's just an incredible amount of data. They were using blue waters to then go in and they trained models on identifying the individual tree crowns because of this area. If you remember the, the image I showed a moment ago, you have these canopies that are, are contrasted against just a, a very, very dark area. And so they were able to take this imagery that's in the, the tens of thousands of images, identify all the crowns, they trained a model on it, and then they identified and counted all these trees. And so now each one of these trees, not only do we have the lat long location for the canopy, we have the area of the canopy, we have a serial number for the canopy, and they're working on the ability to be able to figure out how tall that tree is. There's no way to do this by hand. It's done with AI. And so we put a little viewer together and this is what it starts to look at. This is just you know, a random place in the Sahel and you can see all these individual tree canopies. And you know, one of the things we always think about is how can we ground truth this? And because we have the lat long of this, for every one of these canopies, you just pull up Google, Google Street View. And so on the, on the left, you've got two locations around St. Louis, Senegal. And right here on, on the upper right, the, the little arrow, you can see where we're looking. And, and in the middle on top, you can see that I pointed out two of the trees that you're seeing that have been located with the AI. And below, it's actually finding this individual palm tree you know, on, on the river as well. And so this is one of those applications. We have to go in there and start identifying all these things. We need to quantify it so we can do that next science step. And so just to show you how far we've come, in 1985, they were just identifying basically the primary productivity, the chlorophyll in all these different areas. And they did it with an eight kilometer grid cell. And in 2020, we know that in that area I showed you on the lower right, that there are 18 billion trees in that area, okay? We've moved along in, in 35 years here. And then last week, it, it, uh, it, this, this, this work came out in Nature, and the commentary there was satellites could soon map every tree on Earth, and they can't do it without imagery, without HPC, without really good cold code and AI. And so that's where a bunch of this starts coming back together. And now we're going to go back to Alaska. We're going to go back to, to Anna's work again. And the work has to do with, you know, Alaska, a lot of Alaska is built on permafrost. So the, these are areas of Alaska that are permanently frozen. That, what, you know, if you get a raise in temperature, if the temperature goes up and it goes up enough that in the summer, this area that where the structural integrity is defined by this active layer that has to stay frozen, if that 
thaws in the summer, you get structures, you, know, you, you get things like uh, human infrastructure, like roads like this that fall apart. And then you start getting coastline like this that falls apart. And as we all know, the, the Arctic is warming. And so you're seeing more and more and more of the Arctic and, they're, and it's permafrost, it's thermocars falling apart. And so this is kind of what it looks like in a schematic sense, that you have this, this active layer, you've got ice wedges in there, and then as you get um, warming, these, these wedges um, start to melt from the top down, and you start to see more and more and more water come out of the permafrost until the polygons have a completely different different nature on the right. And then also, this is where it loses its structural integri integrity. And just to kind of point out, you know, an example of how this looks in a town, this is um, Barrow. Um, and th this is the airport in Barrow. And here are a whole bunch of polygons that are right next to the runway. So this is, this is a big deal. And so Anna and, and a few of her uh, colleagues, including Chandi and, um, uh, and a few others, have been taking imagery and then identifying, you know, training it on each one of these, these ice wedge polygons. And they, they start going through it, and then they start adding more and more and more imagery to it. And they can do exactly what Jim and Martin did in the, in the Sahel. They're identifying each one of these polygons, and then they could figure out the area and give it a serial number. And you can come, you can either go back in time if there's imagery, or go forward in time and watch the evolution of this. And this becomes extremely important because you can also use AI to identify all the infrastructure. And so the red here is the infrastructure of a town. And the green are a whole bunch of the ice wedge polygons that were identified through, through their AI model. And so as these polygons change or they disappear, that infrastructure is, is in jeopardy. And so we're going from a time when you had, you know, the, the, the coarsest of data in, in kilometers, in meters. And now we're getting to the point where it's high frequency daily high resolution imagery almost everywhere. And it's allowing us to do, um, to do science on a scale that we could never do before. And I just wanna keep in mind that people like Jim Tucker is a remote sensor, but Heather is, is a physicist who went in, into pe penguin biology. And, and you know, Anna is a, you know, a a field scientist who's doing work in permafrost that now is now working in AI. And so, you know, just to give you a sense of the state of polar cyber infrastructure, you know, we now understand that subschedulers, optimization, networking, storage are all critical for just all the science we do, glaciology, plate tectonics, landslides, vertebrate biology, everything. We can't live without the cyber infrastructure anymore. And we have an increasing demand for computer scientists and software engineers because we are not those people. We're the people in the tents. We need, we need to partner more with, with the computer science, software engineering community, and the people that understand AI. And we have a desperate need for standardized workflows, community codes, community resources, and large data repositories. You know, you know, our center, one of the, you know, one of the uh, we recently went through a, a site visit, and one of the comments was people can get more than three years worth of science done because of the existence of our, of our center, because we can just provide them with um, software engineers and data and all these things that they had to wrangle themselves or hire themselves before. And keep in mind that AI is just a component. We're still gonna go camping. We're still gonna be on the icebreakers. We're, we're still gonna be in the lab. So the challenge is for the polar community, it's field-based and remote sensing. You know, we're, you know, a lot of the cyber infrastructure is new to us. It's hard to get you, you know, this, the software engineers and computer scientists camping. You don't really get this until you go see it in the field and we need to get you out there. 
we're being crushed by data. And you saw, you know, when there was 104 satellites launched by that satellite, that's just something that we're having a hard time dealing with. And we're, we're realizing, and we've realized that AI is critical to broad progress in, in science uh, across both poles. So, you know, all of this stuff, field work, lab work, remote sensing, big data, HPC, cloud computing are all second nature, but AI is missing. We do not have a way of indoctrinating and educating our community into that AI world. And so for the challenges outside of NSF polar science, there's little or no access to high resolution commercial imagery. We, we have access to this in polar. We, we built up the infrastructure in polar. It's not yet really available outside. You know, the rest of the earth sciences are not used to working at this scale. You know, we've got Blue Waters working on this 24 hours a day indefinitely. You know, the, the, the rest of earth sciences just isn't, isn't ready for this yet. The AI practitioners have limited field remote sensing and geospatial experience. You know, how do we cope with this demand? You know, any science that touches the earth's surface would benefit from high resolution time dependent data in AI. And so, you know, the, the last slide I'm gonna show you is this NSF 10 big ideas. We're five of them. We're five of them here. And, you know, it's, it's the obvious one, of course, is navigating the new Arctic, but we're mid-scale research infrastructure, harnessing the data revolution, convergence research, you know, all of this. That's what it comes down to for us. And so, you know, I really appreciate the invitation to come speak to you guys today because we've been sitting for the past decade with quiet successes in polar and we've got to build the bridges to the other communities that can take advantage of what we learned. And so we can take advantage of, of what you all are learning too. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, for such a striking talk. It was outstanding. Thank you. Um, and now we have about 13 minutes for questions. Uh, so please either raise your hand or um, send a chat message to start asking your questions. All right, we have, uh, Daniel, please go ahead. Hey, Paul, um, I guess I, I was just curious, um, thinking about the talks that we had had before and yesterday <clears throat> um, about, are there any real-time aspects to any of the? Yeah, yeah, I mean, real-time, you know, we're. Uh, can, you, can you say anything about I'm that? I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. That, that was really the, the question. Was just the, the the things you described were not real time in in some sense. I mean, they're real time in the sense of maybe days or months or years, but not really in in the scale of. Or we need to do something as soon as we get the data from the satellite. And so I'm just kind of curious if there are any things where the where there's more urgency than you've described in time. It depends on the the community. You know, right now, we're just trying to create an elevation model. Right now, we're just trying to identify the individual polygons. But being able to identify the landslides, to be able to, uh, to look at um, um, uh, deforestation, um, there are aspects of it. It tends not to be NSF with the exception of um, natural hazards and kind of emergency response. And so, you know, um, you know, Amazon I, I'm seeing here, and I know, do you want to comment about how real time, now that you've discovered these, these potential landslides, how real time it's becoming? Yeah, I mean, that's where I want to go. That's where I want to go. That's my dream is that we have real time monitoring, detecting landslides and their movement and also degradation of ice wedges and so on. So that's where I want to go. It's, it's a matter of, I think there's still a lot of work done uh, to do to uh, connect the different data centers around and uh, with where the code is and where the computation is. Uh, so there's there's homework to do there. Um, but yes, that's where I want to go. So I think something that might be related to this was um, a question that I wrote down here about the three to five meter resolution planet cameras. So 
How, what's the data transmission with those? I mean, again, going back to the real time issue, I mean, could something like that be used for a search and rescue operation or things like that if the data transmission rate is high enough? We participate in the occasional um, search and rescue in Antarctica. Um, and so um, there are times, you know, remember, like for the Maxar satellites, they're intended to be commercial uh, sources of data for the DOD and the intelligence community. And so we, it's common for us to have an image collected and then we can get it within a couple of hours. And so a couple of hours for us is, is real time. Um, the planet is, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure about that turnaround. Um, a lot of it, you know, one of the challenges for planet is because they're in the cloud um, and we're talking about a lot of data, there are enormous egress fees. And so we have to be careful about it. Absolutely. Um, any other questions? I think one comment here, um, you can see, for example, the overlap with approaches like high energy physics and MMA, where you want to see AI at the edge. So if you had these lightweight um, uh, approaches for computing, like using maybe accelerated GPU computing or FPGAs, et cetera. You can process those large data volumes in situ. Uh, and, and that would be beneficial in many aspects, even if you are using this information for DOE or DOD aspects, you right. want to get access to that information uh, quickly. Like for example, making sure that there are no uh, nuclear experiments in in areas that are difficult to access and then you, you want to get access to this intelligence, all of those aspects may benefit from applications in MMA and high energy physics. I agree. Um, I see one more hand raised. Uh, Philip, please go ahead. Yeah, so Paul, I, I want to understand how much you reprocess the data. Let's say you have a new algorithm, like a tree identification algorithm, and how much you, you like process, you just, you like run the data and just process it once. Um, yeah, for, you know, when we were developing the algorithms for the, pho the photogrammetry algorithm, um, we would go in and say, oops, you know, we need to reprocess. Um, now things are pretty solid, do it once. With the AI and the tree counting in Africa, They've redone that whole 8% area of the world in Africa multiple times because they're tuning and training. And so um, there, there will be a reprocessing going forward. We're not quite sure how much. You know, Right now, we're just trying to get the planet out, the elevation out. And I'm sure somebody's going to go in there and say, "Well, if you would have used seven instead of three here, it would it would be better." Um, that's, I mean, it, there will be an aspect. Actually, just to follow up about your like reconstruction model. So, for example, in like high energy physics, we have so much data that we basically have one software stack and we just run it on all the data, and you do. When you do a reprocessing, you'll yep. take like 10 petabytes and just, you know, like distribute it, you know, across the globe, reprocess it. And, and you know, if let's say you have like new algorithms, you basically add it on top of this giant software stack and then you just yep. get output data. Is, is that yep. a similar model? Is it, no, because we're producing, the products we're producing right now is an elevation model. And then that goes out to a whole number of hypothesis driven science projects that want to do different things with it. And so one of the aspects of our data that is a little different than yours is it's big, but not quite as big. And we can never delete anything. We, yeah. you know, it takes so long, we can't collect it again. In orbit. And so we're getting these from commercial sources that have licensed it from, you know, to the US government. And so to be able to extract it again from the cloud could be either enormously expensive or very, very difficult. And so um, 
you may do an experiment. You do a whole stock software stack, you know, and run it through that. We w- we could do exactly that same thing, um, but we're we're never going to throw it away, ever, 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 ever. I mean, we don't throw it away. This is this is data we save permanently. The point being is that it's so large that we yeah. can't have like one researcher say, "I've got this new algorithm. Right. I'm going to run right. on the data." Right. You have to. You basically have to. You know, get on the train, and the train the train leaves at you know. December 1st, 2020. Right. Uh, right. And if you don't get on that train, you have to wait until April, right? Right, uh. right. And so I could see in the future, for example, you know, when like that that planet constellation of doves, the little one, when as that imagery comes in, you would do AI and look for the trees, you would do the elevation, you would do various things to it, but we're still in our infancy here compared to you guys. We're, we're not there yet. We're just, you know, we're trying to do that first, you know, for, like, to put it in your terms, we're trying to do that first sky survey. You know, you guys are, are surveying the universe. We're just trying to see the ground. Okay, thanks. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think we have time for maybe one more quick comment or question. So I'll, um, ask one more question then. So uh, how, how can we be involved? I mean, so what is, um, if, if someone only has experience in image analysis, how, how can they help? That's what we're trying to figure out right now. That's exactly what we're trying to figure out because we're coming from this world, you know, Xiao Wen is gonna talk about components of this in an hour, but we're trying to figure out how to get this kind of data in the computer scientists, software engineering hands so that people can play with it. But, you know, the world that I live in requires, you know, I'm in a center. If, if you're funded by my funders, I can give, give you service. But if you're just, you know, there are licensing considerations for the data and then there are considerations for just our time. You know, it's like you can't give away supercomputer time without a proposal. It's that we're trying to figure that out right now. And right now, we know that if we can unlock some of this data for the AI community in the right way, we'll get magic things back. Right. And we're, we're talking to OAC program officers and we're talking to other. This is why I'm giving a talk here, so that somebody would ask that question. I'll comment on that too. I think there's a need for almost like matchmaking <laughs> where, cause I, I mean, I'm used to exceed and we, we used to exceed a little bit too, but it's a limit on how much support we can get from there. Like it, it doesn't take us where we need to go. So there, for, for our work so far, I was fortunate to meet Kent and McHenry on a, on a panel at NSF a couple of years back and that opened up a whole world for me to work with NCSA and, and the people there. And, and they're really helping us m- applying our remote sensing script that's developed by these earth, earth scientists and, and make them ap- possible to run on the Panarctic domain. So it just happened to, because I opened the Kenton door, <laughs> I got access, I got to meet people. So I think up, uh, it almost needs like a place where uh, someone like me who doesn't know how to write code, but has an idea um, can say, look, I have this idea, I have this, I have, and I want to do this, and I have this code with remote sensing people, and I need help to scale it up. And, and that there is sort of a, a network there to plug into, and, and, and software engineers are interested to help us out. So I think that's really what's, what's needed there. And then also, I think there needs to be cross agency talk to, to make sure that the data and the code and the computing is, is all working uh, together and it's, it's, it's easy to, to fly between, so to speak. And let me just say, Anna, that this is the event for the matchmaking. Uh, this is here where we are getting together. We are bringing these different communities. Uh, as Paul was saying, uh, they are trying to map at the Earth. We are trying to map either particle physics world or the universe. We have similar problems. And so you are here because we believe that uh, the, the tools we are developing can be applied across the board. And there is no need to recreate the wheel every time we need to solve a problem. And so tomorrow morning, when we get together to draft the, the plans for future engagement, 
if you can be there in the morning to start planning future steps uh, to participate in the creation of this institute, you're obviously welcome. And I think we have here a great opportunity to demonstrate that AI can serve the community as a commodity tool um, because we have the same challenges uh, in different uh, disciplines. Perfect. Very exciting implications. Um, all right, so we are actually at the end of the session right now. Um, thank you so much for the discussion and for the talk. Um, thank you. Very exciting. And uh, uh, I think, Elio, it's, it's time for the lunch break, I believe. Yeah, so we have an hour to go and enjoy our lunch, and then we'll be back in one hour.